I want you to stop and consider these images and try to figure out which of these things you could live without. The reason I ask? Because none of these things existed in 1877 when we start this course. Not a single one. That is why our theme for this semester is change. There has been more change since 1877 than in the entire history of mankind. In fact, in 1877, their lives were closer to those of the ancient Egyptians or Greeks or Romans than they are to what you know today. I can also tell you that one of the problems for you the, will be on your final exam to discuss what are the greatest changes that have taken place since 1877. So think about it all semester as we talk about change. A graphic example of change is this map. You'll notice that the United States virtually did not extend beyond the Mississippi River. Think of the map today, and that gives you a good illustration of the kind of dramatic change that we're talking about that happens in the period we're studying this semester. Or another example, when you think of these words, transportation and communication, they mean very different things today. Transportation, we think of cars, of airplanes. Communication, we think of our phones, or television, or movies. And yet, in 1877, the definition of these two words was the same because with the exception of the telegram, people did not move information, did not move goods, did not move themselves any faster than they could walk or ride a horse or maybe a train. And so communication and transportation were the same thing. Change can be stressful, or it can be exhilarating, or anything in between. But it's something that we all experience. Your generation will see more change than any generation ever. Just like your parents' generation has seen more change than ever before. But we can learn from change. No, we cannot go back. But we can learn from the mistakes that we made and do better next time. For those of you who have taken the first half of American history, let me do a little summary of the way I see it so that we can get started on new material. First of all, I see the first half of American history as basically building a building. You have to acquire the land. That's what we call colonization and expansion in the first half of American history. You have to lay the foundation. That's what we call the revolution. The Constitution set the basic framework, was the design for the building, if you will. With Jeffersonian democracy, we began to put up the support systems for this new building. 
with the Jacksonians, the building began to take modern form or shape. With the Civil War, we almost tore the building apart, but we were deciding what the final structure would look like. After the Civil War, we had a completed building that we could see what the nation was going to look like in the future. But any of you who have been through any kind of new construction know that everything doesn't turn out perfect. There are mistakes. Some things were miscalculated or were unforeseen. Some things needed to be corrected so that this new building would function properly. And there is always remodeling that needs to be done, updating this building so that it stays functional as time changes. It is these corrections, these updates, this change to the building that we call the United States of America that we will be focusing on during this semester. We are literally going from a time when horses were the backbone of the country to today's modern world with airplanes, automobiles, cell phones, and the internet. Let me give you some examples of things that you are accustomed to that did not exist in 1877. And as we talk about this, think of how this changes the way people live. In 1877, electricity had not been perfected as a power source. Yes, they knew about electricity, but back then, things were run by horsepower, literally, by steam power, or by fire, like burning a kerosene lamp for light. So nothing that uses electricity existed when we start this course. Nothing that runs on gasoline existed. The internal combustion engine, which powers our cars and our lawnmowers and our motorcycles, did not exist. It was first invented in 1879. In fact, gasoline existed, but they didn't know what to do with it because it was so highly flammable and combustible that they were afraid of it. Think of how you might be taking notes on this lecture with a pen. Those didn't exist when we start this class. Fountain pen didn't come into being until, seven, until 1884, and the ballpoint long after that. Think of how the automobile changes the way you live, because they didn't have automobiles back in the 1800s. In fact, automobiles for the masses did not come on the stage until the 1920s. The first powered flight of an airplane was not until 1903, more than a quarter century after we start this class.
ladies, you couldn't vote. Women were not allowed to vote until 1920. There was very little racial integration when we start this class. In fact, schools were not integrated until the 1950s and 60s. There were virtually no federal government programs for the everyday people. Government was a fairly elitist operation that took care of the wealthy, but did very little to help directly help the general population. I know you think of your phone as an extension of yourself, but when we start this class, it was just being invented. And the first few phones were only for commercial use. In fact, private phones in private homes did not become common until the 1950s. If you wanted to listen to some tunes back in the day, you had to go to a concert or make the music yourself because there was no such thing as a phonograph, as audio recording. Moving pictures were not even on the horizon until after 1900. And motion pictures with sound until the late 1920s. So again, if you wanted entertainment, you had to create your own or go to the theater. Electric power was unknown. Yes, they knew about electricity, but not using it as a controlled source of power. Think what your life would be like today without electricity. Without electric lights, we would pretty much have to go to bed when the sun went down and we couldn't start work again till the sun came back up. Personal computers did not exist before 1977. That means that virtually all of the people you interview for your project grew up without having a computer. Soft drinks like Coca-Cola were not invented till the 1880s. And then you had to go to a drugstore where they would concoct your beverage. I'm not even gonna talk about what they did before this, but toilet paper wasn't invented till the 1880s. Ladies, think of yourself in a corset, because when we start this class, that was the only proper dress for a woman. The bra was not invented until the 1890s, and it was still shunned as risque. The only reason it changed was because during World War I, the metal shortage caused a shortage of stays for corsets, and women had to find another way of support. And a phone that was not tied to the wall with a wire, that didn't exist until 1983. And when it was first introduced to the public, it was about the size and weight of a brick. And how did they hold their clothes together? Because the zipper wasn't invented until 1913, 
and Velcro until 1948. When we start this class, you have to either lace it up or use hooks and eyes to keep your clothes closed. The electric refrigerator was not invented until 1911. Before that, you had to depend on ice, if you could get it, or you had to go to the market virtually every day to get your perishable goods. What we think of as breakfast, breakfast cereal, was invented by Kellogg in 1913 as a health food. There was no such thing as potato chips until the 1920s. Can you imagine living in Texas without air conditioning? Well, they certainly did that because until 1902, there was no such thing as air conditioning. The first theaters were not air conditioned until 1925, the first public buses till 1946, and the first central air conditioning units for homes did not exist before 1952. Think of everything in your life that's made of plastic. We had a big old magnet that sucked up everything that was plastic. We'd have virtually nothing left, no clothes, no cars, perhaps not even desks and computers. But plastic was not invented until 1907. There were no credit cards. Credit cards did not come into general use by the public until the 1950s. Back then, if you wanted credit, you had to go to the bank. Or at the store, they would keep a tally of how much you owed so that you could pay them back. How could we exist without pizza? the staple of life. But pizza did not come into existence till 1886. If you had mentioned pizza to a crowd in 1877, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. How many of you routinely wear athletic shoes of some type? Those didn't exist until 1917. Before that, they just wore everyday boots. I don't know how many of you recognize this guy. His name is James Naismith. And he was looking for something to try to keep his football players active during the winter. And so in 1891, he went into the gym and created basketball. My point is that there has been more change in this time period we will be studying this semester than in the entire history of mankind. In fact, your parents' generation have experienced more change than any other generation. You have more computing power in your phone than they had in the first man on the moon mission. Look at this graph. Mankind didn't change very much for the first 11,000 years of history. And then all of a sudden in the late 1800s, the 
graph of change goes straight up and has continued to this day. So in summary, here's a video that gives the greatest innovations that have happened in the 20th century. In other words, none of these things existed. People could not use them because they did not have them when we start this class. Again, think of li how life was changed by these inventions. And change brings about big questions, big issues that we need to think about as we go through the semester. Issues like capitalism versus democracy. Many people today think that those are the same, but are they? Where does the line between personal responsibility stop and government help begin? When we start, government help was just for the wealthy. When we start, the United States was an isolated country that had very little role to play in the world. Boy, has that changed? Is that good or bad? The whole idea of diversity was unknown back then. Everybody was expected to be the same. But as we have developed diversity, have we lost unity? The continuing issue of individual rights versus, versus what is best for the majority. And finally, in a democracy, when we talk about the people, who are the people? Is it you and me? Is it the corporation? Is it the wealthy? Is it the politicians? Who are the people? Perhaps some of you were surprised to hear that there might be a difference between de democracy and capitalism. That difference began to develop during the era that we're talking about the late 1800s. In this video, Bill Brands, historian from the University of Texas, talks about the friction that comes into being between democracy and capitalism. When we start this class, ordinary citizens like you and me had virtually no contact with the federal government. The federal government was helping railroads and, and things like that, not everyday people. But think of all the government programs that you have access to today. Those have all come about during the time period we will study this semester. But it raises the question, where do you draw the line between personal responsibility and government assistance? Again, when we start this, this semester, the United States is an isolated country that is concentrating on developing itself. But during the time period we will study this semester, that all changes to the situation that we have today, where in the minds of some, the United States has become the world's policeman. And the American way has spread around the world, not just in terms of government, but in terms of 
culture. Think of McDonald's existing in Paris or Kentucky Fried Chicken in Moscow. That kind of globalization has happened in the past few years. It did not exist in 1877 when we start this class. And finally, when we talk about change, we have to talk about heritage. What heritage do we embrace? What heritage do we need to change or even get rid of? Whose heritage? When we start this class, the only heritage that counted <clears throat> was white America. Has that changed? 